and uh, we usually start on time and want to do this again so i uh, start now and there might be more people dropping in so a uh, warm welcome everyone um it's a real pleasure uh, to welcome you all and uh, our special guest and friend of the community dave white for today's first topic webinar of own l241 so uh, really good to have you with us again dave Good to be here. Thank you. Yes, and just I wrote this, and you maybe wrote uh, um, read this about Dave. Um, just um, um, just shortly, um, Dave is the head of digital education and academic practice. If that's still your title, no, um, I've, I've been upgraded to dean. Whoa, and dean sorry, of dean of academic strategy brackets online. Although I. I Although it's interesting, the other deans of academic strategy aren't called dean of academic strategy brackets building. So, no. you know, that's an interesting, do you know yes. what I mean? But that's yeah. fine. It's all good. It's a promotion. Yeah. Congratulations. Cheers. And sorry for that miss, but uh, that's all right. <laughs> you're still the president of the uh, yeah. ALT, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. The UK's Association of Learning Technology. Yeah. One of the most inspiring associations for everything related to uh, learning technology in higher education um, some fantastic conferences uh, soon on uh, uh, open educational resources and practices so um yeah fantastic to have you with us um without further ado um take it away and um yeah i like fun. the way you said without further ado which is a French word instead yeah. of a do. I think that's really, I, I quite like that because it's like saying without further goodbyes <laughs> instead of without further nonsense. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Thank you for the intro. Um, and thanks for the in invitation. Um, this is a session we've been doing on the course for a while. I think it works out as a really good introduction. Um, just to say, I'm really happy for people to um, ask questions or make any kind of points or comments in the text chat as we're going along. And I've got the text chat open and I'll, and I'll, um, I'll try and pay attention to it as we go along. In terms of the session and, uh, you know, uh, ONL, um, the, the, the structure of it is I'm going to, I'm going to lay out, um, some thinking, uh, I'm going to explain, uh, visitor and residents if you haven't watched the videos and stuff, but I'll go through that hopefully reasonably quickly um thanks you and i'll that was just me proving i am looking at the chat i think and and then there's an exercise for everybody to do so a mapping exercise which you can do with pen and paper paints chalk you can do it digitally as well whatever works for you but we're all going to be creating these maps and uploading them to a padlet in a bit it's relatively straightforward um and then we're going to you know we're going to talk around the stuff that you've done. So in terms of pedagogy, it's you guys that are providing a good chunk of the content, if you like, today. Um, now, I do this session, I always think this is a bit like 10-pin bowling. So I go 10-pin bowling just infrequently enough that every time that I go, I've forgotten everything about it. And it's like starting from the beginning. I just have this vague dreamlike memory of how to do 10-pin 10, 10 bowling. This session's a little bit like this for me. So I'm going to share my slides. Occasionally, a slide will come as much as much of a surprise to me as it does to you. So um, let's see how we go. I hope that's all right. Oh, I, now, because I've shared, I've lost the chat window. So let me just do a little bit. There it is. The other thing is I'm uh, I'm only on a single screen today. If I'm at, I'm coming to you from I'm coming to you as if this was some sort of major broadcast event. I'm coming to you from our new college building uh, for, of London College of Fashion, uh, which is based on the Olympic Park, the, the Olympic site of the 2012 Olympics. And it's a, a really new building. And it's actually really, it's, it is a really nice building. Okay, so let's get actually started. I, this is a really useful quote from Kevin Kelly, who some of you might know of. He's, he's a kind of futurist. Um, I don't trust futurists, but if you look at what this guy said in the 90s, most of it ended up being quite correct, and he's still around now and really active. <clears throat> and this, this, it's of note that he said this in 1997. 
and um, <clears throat> because it's kind of true, is we are trying to connect everything together. And this is what underpins everything, really. It's always a useful exercise, especially when you're on ONL. To It's always useful to ask the question, what's different about the digital environment? What did the digital environment bring that didn't exist before? Often, um, the things that we uh, go to first when answering that question, it turns out they did exist, but the digital environment has accelerated or amplified them. So it's an accelerationist thing. But this idea of everything being connected together, I think is, is really huge, a really huge principle. And it is largely what, it's, it's largely the reason that the digital environment has, has such a big impact on education or how people learn, perhaps I should put it, perhaps hasn't had as much of an impact on formal education as it should have done. So I just want to kind of open up with that uh, because yeah, for example, if you take something like Wikipedia, it's interesting, now AI has appeared, nobody talks about Wikipedia anymore, but 15 years ago, everybody was losing their minds, they were really concerned about Wikipedia and education. Um, but that seems like quite a quaint or tiny concern compared with AI now looking back. But the only reason Wikipedia could exist, and I'd argue the only reason that generative AI can exist, is that we've all got a connection and we can all post and publish stuff. Um, so it's the two way street nature of the well, the multi mega way street of the network, which actually has this big effect. Before that, institutions, publishing houses, etc., would control the way that knowledge was distributed, including universities. Um, Kevin Kelly did this really great project called the Internet Mapping Project, where he just literally asked people to draw a map of the internet and indicate your home, as you can see. And people just responded to that, you know, really openly. I think there's a Flickr group of these. I've just got a few to show you. The reason I want to show them to you is because everybody has a different conceptual map of the digital environment. Uh, you could argue that everybody has a different conceptual map of the physical environment as well, but um, it's it's probably more extreme with the digital. So when we talk about the digital environment and when we talk about digital education, everybody's kind of thinking a different thing because we're all imagining our own maps of the environment and what's important, what's important to us. So here's, here's a map from a 12 year old, which uh, is, is what I, I, I call it the kind of physical infrastructure sort of principle or imagining of the internet or wires and computers and then his laptop's home and it's got Wi-Fi there. But here's another interpretation. Um, this is closer to how I imagine it. It's all a bit messy and squirrely and there are these sort of stopping off points. I don't know what they might be. The one down in the bottom left is red. Maybe that's their home. Maybe their web pages. Maybe they're useful points of information. I don't know. But still responding to this is a map of the internet. This one's fun. Not sure what's happening here. Could be something to do with data or information passing through a point. Maybe that point is that person's computer. It's another, like these are all legitimate ways of conceptualizing the internet, right? The, the digital environment, the networked environment. And then lastly, this one, which is where the, all, all of the technologies disappeared. Uh, and the digital environment or the internet in this case is just people. And, uh, you know, this is what happens. This is the cycle of an awful lot of technologies, which is that they're invented for uh, very practical purposes, and then they end up being socially co-opted. And through the process of being socially co-opted, they also end up in the education space as well. So, you know, the internet designed to move data around CERN uh, for physicists um, and, the, and for the military, and then it gets picked up by a bunch of hippies, basically, and uh, you get news groups on it, et cetera, et cetera. Then it becomes sort of domesticated, and then you have the emergence of social media, and suddenly you have this technology that was never really designed uh, to be a collection of happy people like this, uh, becoming part of the fabric of how culture and society works. This is pretty huge, and it happened very, very quickly, and education got caught up in that. So my point would be, you know, that, oh, ah, let's go backwards, that this answer here, the wires and boxes and servers is 
just is a reasonable answer and so is that okay uh i think this is quite an old map because uh, i reckon they'd all be sad now <laughs> because of everything that's happened with social media and and politics and all the rest of it online but there was a brief period wasn't there i'd say it was somewhere between i don't know if i think in social media terms somewhere between 2006 and maybe 2011 where it was quite jolly out there but perhaps that was just because it was it was a bit of a monoculture who could say um okay so the point, sort of the point of what we're doing this session is, is, is coming up with our own maps of our of the way that we engage online. And the point of coming up with those maps is then you can see each other's maps and then you can have a useful discussion about what the value of various different sort of modes of engagement and practices might be. Um, whereas, just to put it in really straightforward terms, if you say to, to students, um, how are you using the internet? or if you assume that they're engaging in a particular way for particular reasons, uh, you'll probably miss each other it'll, because you'll be make, there'll be so many different assumptions about what the internet and the digital environment is, what it's legitimate to use for, what you should, which bits of the internet you should be using for what different thing, etc. So that's that. Bit of education stuff. I like this one. Um, as I often say, educationalists, of which uh, there may be some in the room here, obsessed with triangle diagrams, absolutely obsessed by them. They love a triangle diagram. Uh, and, and, and I think that's got something to do with the idea of progression and learning being this sort of stage thing. And obviously, there's a truth to that, certainly at the University of Arts London. So we're, we're the biggest um, creative art and design higher education institution in, in, in Europe possibly the world we're not sure how to measure it so we've got we're like a medium-sized UK university sort of 25,000 students but it's all art design fashion communication media etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and so my view of this in our context is that actually you're constantly iterating around these layers it's not like you're stepping up them neatly but it's fair to say and this is important to sort of highlight that if you start, if you look at access and awareness, then if you don't have a connection to the internet and you don't have a laptop and you don't and you don't have the skill of being able to type, if you don't have some basic literacies, then you're not going to have you're not going to develop any practices and it's not going to inform your identity. And we can think about identity broadly. Uh, my my philosophy, which does sort of align with UAL as an institution, is is education is a process of becoming as much as it is a process of taking on new knowledge and developing new skills. It's both. Um, but I, I think actually for most of our students, uh, whilst they think that this diagram was a bit weird and abstract, I think I think we'd, prob we'd probably all agree that we want our students to leave as different people from how they arrived. I put it that way, in terms of a process. Uh, and certainly our students like to become something to do with the name of the course they're on so you know straightforward one here would be graphic design undergrad they want to become a graphic designer right um that it it, it kind of checks out but i quite like that as a sort of underpinning to what's going on here um it just i'm, I'm just going to call out generative ai because um, this is not a talk or a session about generative ai but um, I think I think it's, it is a really fascinating area. And rather than go on about it, it's specifically I have I, I wrote a blog post a couple about a month ago, which is based on the idea that there's no such thing as a good picture of a horse. OK, so you, you can read the post if you're interested. But basically, to my mind, uh, the emergence of of uh, of. I, I think I think you can draw a kind of history that comes from the, the sort of emergence of the internet, Wikipedia, and you can, and various other technologies through to generative AI. I think they're all, all on the same line. And I think what these technologies do is, if you know Bloom's taxonomy, another triangle, I think what they do is they 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 should encourage us as educational institutions to operate higher and higher up. The, in the pointy bit of the triangle, if you like, because 
the point of technology is to uh, make the lower layers of these kind of triangles um, to allow us to work in those areas more efficiently and theoretically give us more time to do the higher order thinking, critical reflection, synthesis, the, be the becoming stuff at the pointy end of all those educational triangles. Um, at UAL, the, 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 one of the ways we deal with that is, is, is the, in terms of assessment, the emphasis is less about what you've made, if it's a creative course, and more about you being able to articulate the journey that led you to make that, to, to making that thing. Okay, thanks for the link in the chat. Um, I just wanted to mention it because I feel like it's there. I, I, I guess just to really sum that up, I, I, I encourage people to think about um, what, because there's always an emergent technology which fills up this kind of space uh, in terms of the psychology of educational institutions. There's always a technology that we think might save us all and or might kill us all. And in educational terms, there's always a technology that is in that kind of, um, uh, this could destroy education, but also let's use it to make ourselves more efficient. And it's, so it's a little bit, it's a little bit of an odd tension, but as I say, 15 years ago, this would have been a slide about Wikipedia. So let's not panic. Okay. I think, I think it's, um, uh, your head of Microsoft guy who said, and I like this quote, I know everybody knows this quote, but he said, um, Bill Gates said, we always overestimate the short-term impact of technology and underestimate its long-term impact, which I think is quite wise. Anyway, enough of the, enough of the hand-waving opening up of the session. If anybody's got any questions or points, uh, as I say, drop them into the chat. I'm just going to lay out a, a few ideas that set up the mapping activity, and then we're going to do the mapping activity. So this is the point that's worth paying attention to, because uh, <laughs> otherwise you'll do what I do in sessions, which is where you sort of you, you sort of think you're paying attention. Then somebody goes, OK, let's start the activity. And you're like, wait a minute, what did he say? So this is that bit. Digital natives, uh, many of you, some of you might have heard of this concept of digital immigrants and digital natives, which was uh, uh, put forward by Mark Prensky around about 2000. And it, it was a really powerful idea. I guess it still is. And it essentially, the, 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 uh, the principle is that if you grow up, the technology that you grow up with around you, you're kind of native to. And you kind of pick it up as a natural part of the kind of fabric of your world. Whereas if you are older, when and that technology sort of appears in your life when you're already an adult, then perhaps you're an immigrant into that technology. And it's a little bit harder for you to adapt to it and use it smoothly. There's some truth in that. But ultimately, the digital natives and immigrants idea was almost used by um, universities, certainly in the UK, as an excuse for not really thinking about how to support students in their digital practices, uh, because it was used as a way of saying, well, the kids get all the technology, we're just dinosaurs, they're all right, they're good with it, et cetera, et cetera. But, but you know, how do you go about effectively uh, researching a subject or a project online. That's got nothing to do with how well you can use the internet. That's like an academic set of practices. And I think occasionally we forgot the difference between being good at using your phone and being good at being a scholar, right? So these, I, it, it became a bit of a lazy idea. Um, so I'm gonna actually, I'm going to actually ask you guys just to type into the chat what 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 your what your interpretation of digital native is. It doesn't have to be the same as mine, or if you like, you know, how you've seen it being used. Assuming that you've heard it, you know, how does that play out in your institution? Just type in like a thought into the chat. It doesn't have to be a big complex thought. You know what what are you what do you think digital native means now? I'll just give it a couple of minutes.
Yeah, that's right. He did kind of apologize for it, but he also continued to get paid a lot of money to go around conferences on the back of the original idea. Comfortable with TikTok. Yeah, not afraid. That's an interesting, that's an interesting ideal, I think. Um, so prepared to experiment. Um, I mean, I do, I, yeah, comfortable, familiar, integrated. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so that's interesting. Little or no inhibitions about posting and interacting online. Yeah. And that's, that's fascinating as well, because I think sometimes we sort of go, oh yeah, Gen Z, they're all over Instagram, which is not true. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Some of us are, some of us aren't, right? So I think, I think what I, these are great comments actually. Yeah. Yeah. Age is not a guarantee for technology, knowledge, absolutely. But also there's that social and identity layer. So being good with, so, all right, I'll put it this way. You know, a cohort of computer scientists, are the, uh, students, are they going to be all over Instagram? Maybe, maybe not. They're really good with technology. That doesn't mean they're going to be super active in social media, right? Because of the difference between how good you are with technology and what you actually choose to do with it especially when it becomes network, social, educational, right? Um, I'd say the key thing here is that we don't operate generationally too much, if you like. We, we, edu universities are really good at going, students are at X, Y, Z, right? But if students went, uh, you know, people in their 40s like these things and they act like this online, a lot of us might be really offended, but we do that to students all the time. And this, that idea um, of the digital native doesn't help really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, to the point about the university ID, what I'd say is um, uh, being really slick with social media is not the same as knowing how to engage with administrative processes. For example, right? So weirdly, uploading a photo into Instagram should be the same as uploading a photo for your ID card, but one of them is your own personal identity practice, and the other one is a terrifying university administrative practice that makes no sense to you, even though it's sort of the same, right? I've got kids, I've been there. So a really useful phrase is we can we sometimes confuse ownership with capability. So we see people who own really nice phones, really nice laptops, really nice headphones. And we and we, we kind of confuse that with the ability to use the thing itself or with practice. This, these are great answers in the chat. Thank you. I wish, I, I, anyway, th I'll get through this quickly. I, I did an on stage with uh, Mark Frinsky a few years ago and um, I found it really annoying. You, there's a blog post about that as well. I won't go into it. <laughs> His, his characterization of higher education was not one that I agreed with. Oh, hello. Um, so let, let's talk about the mapping that, um, and we'll get into it and I'll go as quickly as I can. So what I, what I proposed uh, a while back in response to natives and immigrants and also in response to some research projects I was doing around education as well was this idea of visitor and resident. And I'm just going to explain it quickly and then we're going to use it to create maps. Um, apologies if you've already watched videos and stuff like that. Um, so this is a continuum. It's not two separate boxes. Uh, and it's about modes of engagement online. It's, I'm not trying to say some people are residents and some people are visitors. We all do bits of both, if you like, and that's what makes it useful. The easiest way to explain it is to explain either end of the continuum. So. Uh, at, at, at the hard end of the continuum here, um, if you're in visitor mode, then you kind of see the web as a series of tools. You figure out what you want to do, you find the tool you need, you do the thing you want to do, and then you sort of step away from it. Um, the key thing is you don't leave a social trace on the surface of the web, okay? So your, your activities aren't connected to a digital identity in a meaningful social or connected way. You'll leave a data trace though, right? Uh, you can be in visitor mode in what I'd call resident spaces. So you could loiter around in, in Instagram and never post anything, for example. In resident mode, you're, you're, you're kind of engaging with the web as a series of spaces or places. 
So you will, that will involve a digital identity. You will leave a social trace. Your, your motivation for engaging in resident mode will be to connect with other people, to make yourself visible as a person, okay? So visitor mode, it tends to be quite instrumental in some ways. Resident mode tends to have a kind of social or identity aspect to it. The middle of the continuum is where an awful lot of online activity actually happens, especially in education, which is where it's somewhat resonant, but it's within a closed group or community. So you know where the edge of it is. So this session now is somewhat resonant, but there's an edge to it, if you like. The hard, the, the really extreme end of residency is where you're posting something and anybody could see it online and you don't even know who those people might be, all right? The really open web, which is slowly being kind of shut down over time for various different reasons. Okay, so that's that. We add a ver vertical axis to it because context really counts. Your online practices, your online uh, engagement will be different in a personal context to an institutional one. I found personal and institutional to be good contexts for laying this stuff out. You don't have to use that, but it seems to work quite well. It comes from the early days of of where uh, the internet and education started to intersect and um, we didn't separate this out enough. And I think that's got something to do with academia, for example, being a very, very powerful personal identity. Some people, you know, some people don't separate those two things out. But anyway, so here's a really old map of mine from 2013. This is what it used to look like. I used to be all over Twitter before it was called X. Uh, it was mainly for work, but there's a bit of personal stuff. It was all mixed up. I used to have Skype switched on all the time in my previous job and people could just hit Skype bit like people do with teams and and stuff like that now people could just call me on skype whenever and have a chat blogging i do for work but i do leave the comments open i'm happy for people to so that that's quite residential it's linked very much to my professional identity because these are my professional opinions so if i just whiz over to the other side of the map personal and email i'm not very social in it it's just administrative so that's very personal and visitor facebook at the time I was just a really terrible address book, really. I never posted anything. I rarely went in there. So I wasn't very resonant in it. And then there are some things that sort of jammed in the middle because they're just this sort of really untidy mix of everything. A more up-to-date map, and you can see, and I think this has happened to a lot of people, WhatsApp has eaten an awful lot of that space. Uh, Twitter is, I'm much quieter on now, post-Elon, um, and Post, you know, during COVID and post the pandemic in my institution, Microsoft Teams became the place that you were very present and very resident professionally, if you like. The blog's still there, but it's a bit more visitory because people don't tend to blog comment so much. Uh, and actually, I've, start, I've shifted my Twitter practice into LinkedIn, actually, because you actually can have quite constructive professional conversations in LinkedIn. And then various other things in there. Uh, I joined a sports club that's local, which means that I'm a little bit more active in Facebook. So you see these things change over time. So I hope that makes sense, All right? Your map that won't look like my map, it might have similar things on it. That's just to give you a sense of this process. What I'm gonna ask you to do now, and do jump on the mic or ask any comments if you want to is, um, ask you to grab a pen and paper or a digital pen and paper and draw your own map. Uh, you won't get it right first time. You know, it's best just to not overthink it and just scratch it out nice and quickly. After a few minutes, when you when you feel like you've got the main chunk of it down, then you can grab this QR code or go to the link that Jorg's put in the chat that that'll get you to a padlet the easiest way to do that's on a mobile phone so if you've done it on paper you can take a photo of your map and then follow that link and upload it to a padlet and then we'll spend a good chunk of the rest of the session which is about right about halfway through discuss you know just having a chat around your maps to be super clear the maps are quite useful for personal reflection but the real value of them is not the maps themselves, but the conversations that they encourage us to have around them. Yeah, I'm going to show the coordinates again. I'm going to leave it on that one. Yeah, that's the axis. 
and um, in a few minutes time, I'll, I'll shift it back to the QR code if that's the way that you want to get to Padlet. So I'm going to do something I'm not very good at, which is I'm going to try and stay quiet for at least three or four minutes. Whew, it's the, always the biggest challenge. Yeah, thanks, Sean. I see a mobile phone up and ready. Ah, excellent. I see some of them appearing. Um, I think the way that I'm tabbing between things means that I'm now sharing the Padlet. Is that right? Through no. Music. I'm not. Okay, that is useful. That is useful to know. So what I'm going to do is, because it doesn't look like that <laughs> to me. How's that? Is that is that the Padlet now? That is the Padlet now. All right, brilliant. And so who was first out of those two? Is it Murmur? I mean, we could make you joint winners of the thing that doesn't exist. <laughs> Here's some more. Okay, Murmur gets the prize. The uh, yeah, well, even I mean, you know, if you got prepared, then that's all good. I mean, you know, that's how you that's how you win at these processes, right? You do the reading, you do the background work, you do the hope. So my eldest kid is he's he's going to start on a master's in art gallery museum studies in Manchester in September, and because he loves the subject, he's already started to do the set reading for it because he's that much of a nerd. So how's that for prepared? <laughs> Uh, next level i'd say well what you do uh yeah i'll find hang on let me find yeah it's a good point let me uh go back to the qr code just for a second uh i'm hoping that's the qr code if you want to find your way into the padlet thanks for this um those are all coming in really nicely we'll have plenty to talk around I'll, I'll leave the QR code there for a few more seconds. And if not, then the the hard links in the in the chat. Oh, well, this is the easiest way to do it if you've got your mobile, isn't it? I was so unconvinced by QR codes when they came out. I was like, it's just a square barcode. But now that it's kind of inherent in all of the phone apps, in all of the 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 photo, you know, the the camera apps, that they're actually pretty decent. Pretty right. useful, actually. Yeah. Yeah, especially as my phone seems to be able to grab them from about a quarter of a mile away now. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to the Padlet now. We'll we'll, we'll have a little chat. Um. So I think. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slightly arbitrarily, and that is a poor use of English. Uh, pick a map, and then if you'd like to get on the microphone and just sort of talk it through with me, that would be great. If you'd prefer not to, that's fine. If you want to drop uh, uh, any thoughts into the chat, um, and you, you could do it that way instead of on the microphone. Or if you just don't want to talk about it at all, that's fine. I'll just jump to another one. But clearly, I think it's only right that we start with murmurs. I hope, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. So here's your map. Did you, did you want to get on the mic and sort of talk us through why your map looks like this? I'll leave that. Hi. Uh, Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I, I actually watched your videos and uh, I started thinking and now I, I figured out that I've got about emails. I do use emails, but I don't see them as important. And uh, there's also WhatsApp, Viber app, apps where uh, you give access to people to um, actually pest you with all sorts of um, short messages. But um, yes, uh, what I do... Uh, these days really intensively is I am present on Discord as a teacher. Discord is a, an app that is generally used for gaming and uh, we use it as a um, learning management system, so to say, um, because it's free and because it actually uses less uh, bandwidth than uh, Zoom and um, other options and students already have accounts there. And um, well, yeah. we what, do, store... what, what, are you, what, what are you teaching? I teach English, well, literary course, introduction to literary studies right now. And yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's uh, quite something to be taking a subject that's so traditionally humanities and to be yes. teaching in discord. It, it's not what people would imagine, but it's a really good example of, you know, what actually happens. Yes, but it also is, uh, I think it already became something that is expected. So we're expected to, to produce an online presence for the course. Um, yeah, I think I'm thinking about the fact that Discord has that kind of quite hardcore gaming background to it. So it's a good example of how um, uh, the platform, no platforms particularly mandate the kind of practices that you might do in the platform if you like you can use discord to teach english literature the same as you can use it to play on minecraft i don't know perhaps there would be a slight difference i hope uh, but they also offer bots that are very useful for a formal um, or formal education approach uh, they are something to deal with, like definitions and story writing that I found really, really neat and really useful. That's brilliant. And yeah. the rest of it is, I think, as everybody else, you've got uh, a good story going uh, with a visitor and resident and personal and institutional approach. I guess this is a good map, a way to, to map activities. Yeah, okay. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks. I think, I think you know, we we get a sense of your digital world from from the map. As I say, I wouldn't have been able to guess what you taught, but then that's interesting in of itself. Thank you for that. I'm going to move to another map. Okay, thank you. Brilliant. Uh, okay, I'm going to go to Annette here. If you want to get on the mic, the the reason I've chosen it is because you've got a lot of resident stuff, mm. um, and I think a bit like the previous map. That's Probably because those are the things that resonate and more interesting to you rather than you don't uh, actually use email, for example. Um, I, I was just filling in stuff like chat GPT and Po, which I do access for work over on more of the visitor site currently. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And also uh, other things, Spotify. Discord, I rarely go there. I definitely only go there when people tell me to go there. So they'd be more on the visitor side. I just had too many to fill them all in, kind of. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's it's been interesting to me having done this over a number of years. I think maybe the first time I did this was in 2008. And it's interesting just how much more populated the resident side, especially the resident institutional quadrant is than it was back in 2008. Um, so you very... oh yeah, I've also yeah. added up LMS and email and stuff down in that corner. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, so again, um, and this is how things shift. And I think COVID accelerated this was when people first started putting VLE uh, LMS in. It was much close. It was much more down the visitor end than on the resident end. But now I think they're used as a more sort of engaged resident type space. Yeah, and I guess. Is Zoom your institutional synchronous platform of choice? Um, if we can choose, yes. We also have Teams where we try to avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Though my EU project is actually running in Teams. So yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. but there's also the 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 skewed factor here that I am a digital learning consultant. So right. it's not really super surprising that I have a bunch of platforms and a lot of a lot of things on the rest and then well, it's not super surprising, but it wouldn't have to be like that. I know plenty of people that learn that work in digital learning that aren't that active resident. This is what I'm trying to say is that the the authentic the authenticity or the legitimacy of resident end practices is a relatively recent thing. In 2006 and 2007, if you talked about resident practices, largely people would have thought that you were either some sort of social media uh, narcissist or that you were just a tech nerd. So it's only in the last 15 years or so that it's become a thing. So, okay, brilliant. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to go to another map. Uh, Apologies or, or congratulations if I don't get to your map. Um, Depends how you look at it. Yeah, that's our focus. Why is that? Uh, Let's have a look. I'm just shifting around single screen. Okay. I'm going to go to KK. Partly because one of the things I like about this process is that if, if whether you do it on paper or, or, or uh, digitally, you kind of get a sense of the person from their approach to mapping. Is it circles? Is it squares? What does the handwriting look like? And also, what does their thumb look like? That's always nice too. Um, um, so who is KK and do you want to talk about this? Um, I, I can talk about it. Okay, brilliant. Talk us through this. It's, it looks like a relatively simple map uh, <laughs> and it looks like you spend almost your entire life in a myriad of WhatsApp groups, but you, you tell us about it. Yeah. I mean, uh, like what you said just now, uh, WhatsApp has become more predominantly as the media or the social media that I use because um, I, I, I'm getting a little bit concerned about what other social medias are doing and they are collecting information and it's all in the open and so forth. Mm-hmm. So from WhatsApp, I, I'm able to control the group and yep. what I share and, and things like that. So WhatsApp has indeed become more powerful and uh, more, more permanent to me in how I use uh, social media. And um, in the work space, uh, MS team, LinkedIn. In fact, um, this afternoon I'll go have a discussion about LinkedIn. I think it's becoming an expectation that you have a LinkedIn presence. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That you build a certain brand around you in LinkedIn, and because it's important professionally. Mm, on a personal front, I use a lot of Gmail, uh, Google Drive. Yeah. Because those are things that allows me to communicate and store information and share. So it's, it, it's predominantly how I do things and, and, and so forth. And the rest of the things like Facebook, uh, Reddit, Pin, Interest, uh, they, have, they are more personal uh, and they have become smaller in, in recent years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's all I would say. Yeah, and our maps shift over time, don't they? Uh, with the ebbs and flow, kind of of who we are, what we're doing for a job, but also what's going on in the digital environment. It's interesting. It's interesting seeing the emergence of WhatsApp for me because I think um, people got sort of to what you're saying. People kind of got wary of their data. I think students are much, much more tuned into that issue of data now, um, in a, in a really good way. There's a small, there's a, there's a, there's a small, uh, and again, not to be generational about it, but there, there's a, there's a small patch of time where people did genuinely see the internet and the emergence of social media as being uh, quite uh, utopian almost, and, and we're sharing and chucking stuff around, and then it gradually got engineered from out underneath them, uh, mm. and then, and then you could see students coming through and going, being a bit more canny, a bit more wise about that. I also think that these that these differences, there's this period of time where um, phones were developing very fast. I honestly think there's a slight difference between um, people who uh, their first phone only had text on it or their first phone was a smartphone. I'm very sensitive to this because that was my old, that's the difference between my oldest kid and the younger kid. But actually it had quite a big effect on how they engaged with the world. 
So it's been so rapid, I think is what I'm saying. Um, okay, thank you for that. Uh, just Annette in the chat, I'm exactly the same. Uh, I was very disappointed to uh, find myself moving to LinkedIn because I never liked it because I thought it was a bit dry, but I have to be honest, it is now the place where you can have a sensible discussion about quite complex professional things. Uh, and Twitter makes me uh, uncomfortable. Um, okay, I think what I think what I'm going to do rather than uh, I'm not I, I think we'll move on if that's okay. Um, there's some great maps there. There's some fascinating ones. That JL one looks. I mean, what's happening there? That looks really interesting with things inside things. Uh, as you can see, people interpret it slightly differently. There's no right way to do it. Um, and in terms of ONL, you know, this is like a resource to reflect on if, 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 you know, if you want to blog about it or whatever it might be, these are just here in the Padlet now. But what, what I do often with groups of staff and sometimes with students as well is exactly this process, but we have a little bit longer and everybody goes around chatting about each other's maps. And by the end of the session, everybody's actually got a bit of an insight into what forms of engagement and what types of practices are meaningful and valuable to different people and where they intersect and where they cross over, um, which I think is really, if I think if I was teaching an undergraduate course, I'd do this really early and I'd get everybody to share. And then I think the students on the kind of courses we have at UAL, I'd encourage them to kind of self negotiate those kind of shared spaces, you know, what kind of collaborative work, what kind of communication are they going to do via what platform? Uh, I don't think the university will ever provide all of those platforms. I think you need a balance of sort of institutional, non-institutional, and some of the blurry edge ones. But actually for any group of people, and you'll get this all the time in work, obviously, because you get the classic, should we do it in Zoom or Teams or whatever, you know, actually figuring out how to negotiate where those shared and collective spaces are going to be and what represents authentic work and what represents inauthentic work in those spaces is actually a really difficult thing to do so the maps can help with that yeah a lot of people in mastodon um but you know it's always tricky isn't it because you need a crit critical mass of people i've just looked at joe's map special mention for joe's map for using colors um yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So things sit inside each other. Anyway, look, I'm just getting into it too much because I find it, you know, obviously I find it interesting and I don't want to, I need to, I got nine minutes. That's what I'm saying. All right. So we'll finish on time. I hope you found that valuable. It's worth going back to your map every so often and considering what's changed. Um, we've had a discussion. We're all right. Just a couple more ideas to throw in and then a couple of, and then I want to go through where you can kind of take the maps whether that's to do with um, sort of collective understanding or using it for, as a research instrument. This is just like a little bit of, um, you know, folksy philosophy for me in some ways. Yeah, a lot of what we're dealing with in education is these tensions between hierarchical ways of doing things and network ways of doing things, whether that's to do with power or learning or whatever it might be you need a bit of both to make things work universities are sort of naturally very hierarchical but because of the digital environment they can that kind that kind of means that our institutions are constantly intersecting with networked ways of working and thinking like connectivism which i think is really important for own health to me the art of it is finding the sweet spot between the two things and not just having a head-to-head -head argument but what I tend to find is when 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 something contentious comes up, when something a bit difficult comes up in the university, it, you, you can quite often read it as a tension between hierarchy and networked ways of thinking and doing, right? Um, so in, in theory terms, and you can look into this over the course, you know, you could argue that the hierarchy is constructivism and networked is connectivism, depends how you look at it depends how you want to theorize it it's just it can be a useful way of unpicking things and certainly onl this came from a blog a few courses back this concept of the course is the content and you know uh, dave cormier has written a lot about this in terms of rhizomatic learning i'm sure you'll bump into his work and um the idea of the community is curriculum um this, this kind of self-generative 
there isn't a really really rigorous curriculum or syllabus but 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 what you're trying to do pedagogically is create the conditions for people to uh, learn together um, which is not easy actually and can end up being really exclusive uh, because of the you need some pretty sophisticated literacies to do that successfully because it involves deciding negotiating how you're going to work together it's a bit like work <laughs> negotiating how you're going to work together deciding what's authentic these are quite difficult things very quick run through sort of a brief history of mapping this was the these were the maps that came from the first ever workshop i did and i immediately noticed that facebook was all over them in different places and that's how i knew that something interesting was going on i.e the platform as i said earlier the platform doesn't mandate the mode that you engage with it and actually a lot of platforms the successful platforms deliberately allow you to lurk or post or just slide through or engage in various different ways, right? Platforms that say you have to do it this way, they don't last very long. Um, some people's maps are really blank. That's fine. This map came with a note. It was from a PhD student who said, I think social media is evil and is just stealing my data and trying to sell me things. That's a legitimate view, right? The point would be that, that how populous your map is, is not an indication of whether you're doing what you're doing well or badly. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? The point is not to fill it all in. The point is to, it, hopefully it gives you a, a perspective that allows you to actively think about where you're engaging and disengaging so that you retain some kind of agency or control over that. I think certainly a lot of students feel like they're pushed around by the digital environment. If you've read Zuboff's uh, Age of Surveillance Capitalism, it's a bit depressing, but I think uh, contemporary students are well aware that they're being behavior engineered, that, they, that there's a risk of addiction, that there's all sorts going on. And I, I, you know, my point isn't there's a correct way to engage or, a dis or, or an incorrect way to engage. My point is that however you're choosing to do it, choose to do it, right? Easier said than done, okay? Because I've watched a lot of videos of people falling off mountain bikes, far too many. And I believe I got addicted to them. Um, this person had used colors because they had multiple identities in their lives. You know, they had like they they they, they, they uh, and what they had was two Twitter profiles and two email profiles and two. So some people have what I'd call a converged approach, where that they only have one identity in any given platform, and they use that for personal and for work, you know, like in WhatsApp, let's say, but you can manage that within that. Some people are organized enough to have multiple profiles, and that's how they do it. They decompartmentalize. Um, I won't go into that one. This one's fun because this we didn't ask them to do this, but they put a sad face on SharePoint. So the map doesn't necessarily indicate how people feel about the different things. And sometimes, especially I'd say if you're working with students, but it could be the same for any anyone, we've had some success just giving people happy, sad and bemused stickers, little emoji stickers, and they just stick them all over the map. And then they can go and then you're like, oh, you, this is a huge square on your map, but you hate it. <laughs> you know, that's also useful. Um, different colors for different identities. So this person ran a sports club, also had a day job. This person had too many identities. That would freak me out. They, um, you could get arty with it. But I mean, I guess I show this one. People have done it with pastels and watercolors because actually the, 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 these things have very blurry edges. Um, very quickly, very quickly. What can you do with it? I did, I, 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 uh, again, a little while back, we got 380 something maps from... Uh, staff and students across about 18 different UK institutions and then I literally just went through and looked at which quadrants were were populated and which ones weren't the point here is this age one down in the bottom left hand corner here which is basically saying that uh, the the once you normalize the data the range of ages that had a fully filled in map was completely even i.e. digital native digital immigrant doesn't check out so i was pleased with that it was like an actual bit of research so it didn't really check out because it didn't matter what age you were there were all sorts of different people being resident just quickly somebody done consumer creator here that kind of resonates as well 
Some people do arrows to say this is the sort of direction that that practice is heading in. It's becoming more resident or it's becoming more visitor. You know, like a lot of people have been saying Twitter's kind of either you've left or it's become more and more visitor. And sometimes practices connect up. So for me, uh, you know, I, I I used to tweet something. If the, if there was an interesting discussion, I'd write a blog post. If that if the if 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 that resonated with people, then maybe I'd do a conference talk and I'd make a video and I'd post that. And so you know, practices connect up. Um, I'm just going to go to this one last of all because it's one of my favourites, which is um, and then I need to leave the room. Is uh, the pink area there is aspirational. They don't actually have that practice, um, but they want to become a digital public scholar or a, sort of a, a really visible scholar in that resident space. Okay, I just wanna end on this quote because it's kind of the bookend to the Kevin Kelly one, which is, um, this is from George Siemens, who, who is a great scholar in this sort of space. And I really, really like this. This, this is a description of what it means to teach is that now there's an abundance of connections and knowledge. Teachers are the arbiters of connections, not the gatekeepers of information. I'm going to finish up there. Thank you for those maps. Hopefully they're a good resource for you. Thank you all for running the session. I'm literally going to have to run because there's somebody booked coming to this meeting room now. So it's like a proper higher education scenario that's going on here. If that's okay. That's okay. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, excellent session once again. Thanks. All right. Brilliant. Cheers. Um